Presence. Yes, this week on Past and Presence, we're back on Bethel's old campus on Snelling Avenue, just south of Larpenter. Again, that's the seminary building, the oldest building from 1914. Now, the seminary merged then with Bethel Academy, a Swedish-American high school. Its building was uh, started in 1915. It's right over there. And they moved in in 1916. Now, if you look out at the quad, you see an athletic field here in the center. In 1917, World War I started. And one day in May 1917, the whole, whole community just dug up that field for a liberty guard. They implanted beans and potatoes. Uh, the academy lasted until 1936. Uh, and then it closed in the Great Depression. In 1931, Bethel started a junior college, so kind of like a community college, first and second year, and then people went to the University of Minnesota or other schools. After World War II in 1947, it became a four-year college, and Bethel remained here then, the seminary until the 1960s, and the college until 1972. We'll talk more about why Bethel moved up Darden Hills a little bit later in the webisode, but this seemed like a really good location to host our conversation for this week. Looking at John Fia's chapter is about two different ways of thinking about history, one is presenting a usable past. You know, there's something valuable about coming back to Bethel's campus. It actually helps remind us of our roots, of where we've been. But at the same time, Fia suggests that sometimes the past is a foreign country. It's very different. And even here at a place that not so long ago was Bethel, where people took history classes and people taught and people learned and worshipped and prayed, it's not quite the same. There is something a little bit alien about it. So to get us into that discussion, let's turn it over to two more of our faculty discussing the past as a foreign country and the usable nature of the past. Welcome to a very special conversation. Uh, for the first four weeks of the class you've heard from our faculty, we thought we should actually bring in some current students. So welcome to Kelly Van Wyck and Jacob Manning of the class of 2015, two of our history department teaching assistants. You'll actually meet them a little bit later on in the uh, webisode series as we'll interview them and talk about how they became history majors, what it means to be a TA. But we also wanted to bring them in to get a student perspective on our readings for this week as we read from John Fia about uh, the nature of the past, what does historians do? So let me start with this question. I don't know if this is unique to Americans, but I think especially for Americans, history has to have some kind of utility, right? It has to be or it's in the negative, useful. yeah, it has to be yeah. useful. Or in the negative, this is what you hear about like a history major is it's not practical, it's not relevant. I guess, first of all, as history majors, how important is that question to you? I mean, is it actually important that there be some use for history? And if you found that, what what is the use that you've seen? Why, what is useful about studying the past as a historian? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, this is something that comes up a lot, like in, the, in my uh, educational equity class, actually. We talk a lot about um, how historically race has been constructed in the United States and in what ways does it shape the current um, discussion. And I don't think <laughs> any of us would disagree that that conversation is irrelevant when we look at things like going on in Ferguson. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I've just seen yeah. how history has really benefited me in not only giving me the tools I need to dive into those questions, but also just looking at the importance of context and mm -hmm. seeing how things that are happening in the news today aren't just happening in a vacuum and we don't know where they came from. You can follow a really specific trail back in history and see how interactions particularly between African Americans and whites, um, have come to become where they are today, leading to events like Ferguson. So that's where I've really seen it become really useful, is understanding where we've gotten to <laughs> today. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. That's a good that. example. That's yeah. really good. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that, partly because I imagine that maybe, because you're history and social studies at Kelly, that maybe you get a little bit, I mean, you're preparing for a career right. with history as yeah. well. But I think right. what you're saying, that's not necessarily limited to people who are going to be teachers. I mean, that that's a larger question for a, I mean, any population is its version of this, but for Americans, as they contextualize a current issue, they need to look to the past to understand it. Mm -hmm. yeah. you know, one thing Fia talks about is one use of studying the past is that it actually can um, generate progress. You know, it actually, so he gives the example of studying Reconstruction and slavery actually is used by progressive historians to agitate them for civil rights in the mm -hmm. 20th yeah, century. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that would be a the history kind of application to, of it. Yeah. To today, yeah. I think for me, uh, I just first say that question is very important. Um, I think it's also misunderstood by those who are generally live and breathe outside of the humanities. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it, it's it's something that um, as as history people we need to be able to give an answer and, and defend. I think a little bit. So as I've been processing that over the past couple of years, I think the biggest thing is um, uh, knowing history helps you answer and and understand these two points, which. Uh, is that we aren't the only people to have ever lived mm -hmm. in our time. Mm -hmm. um, 
and we aren't the best and smartest people to ever live. <laughs> what? <laughs> I, I, I can't. Possible. I, did you guys hear that before? Yeah. I don't know. This is news. It's a news me. flash, I yeah. think. But that's only true of students, right? Yeah, that's yeah. I think, I think, yeah. That's that Good. could be. Um, <laughs> so, just know, thinking about those two things, um, if we're going to really understand what's happened in in how, uh, whether it's in science, math, um, in the the race issues, in the, those dynamics of our country today or just politics, mm -hmm. <laughs> you need to know um, how the things that are happening relate to what's gone on in the past and who the leaders have been in the past. Well, so, and I think also that you're pointing yeah. to something we'll, we'll actually come back to in the course and feel will come to, which is history is useful in the sense that it changes you. I mean, and we talk a lot in this department about things like intellectual humility and empathy. And, and so one thing feel will say is it gives you a sense of your smallness in some ways. Exactly. And, and hopefully yeah. corrects the sense you're the center of the universe. And that mm -hmm. actually is useful, but it might be a different kind of use than what people mean when they demand history be practical and, and, and relevant. Yeah, I think it's character forming right. in some sense where where if we don't live with a sense of respect for what's what the developments have been in the past leading up to where we are now, whatever our field might be, um, we live with a kind of uh, unconscious arrogance mm -hmm. about what we're doing with our lives. So right. You had a second point too, Jake. I don't know if you got to it. Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, so we aren't the only people to ever live. That's mm -hmm. kind of the the humility piece. And then we aren't the best and smartest okay. people to ever live. So that's the idea that, like you were saying with Ferguson, um, there may be uh, things we can learn from the past about failures, but there also may be things in the past we can learn from that are great successes. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, in the history of, of science or of math, uh, we have to understand the kinds of people that led uh, that were um, responsible for major developments. We think of just Sir Isaac Newton. Mm -hmm. um, point to him all the time. Understanding him as a historical figure can be really inspiring mm -hmm. and also very educational for understanding well, why do we have the calculus? Oh, mm -hmm. someone invented that. You mean people invent stuff like that? Yeah. You know, so we can see progress in both learn from failures of the past and also from the great successes of people in the so past. So I think you're pointing to a couple of, um, yeah, you, you do hear this as an answer. History is useful because it's inspiring. Um, yep. You know, I think even in a class like CWC, you know, in their first semester at Bethel, the students will hear, you're going to meet a great cloud of witnesses, and you're not going to agree with all of them, but in some ways, some of them will probably inspire you. I mean, they will actually point yeah. you towards Christ to be a Christian version of this. Um, so it can be inspiring, and there are American national versions of this, too, um, and every field has its inspiring figures. Um, but also that it can be instructive. History has lessons to teach mm -hmm. us. And, and maybe that's kind of the approach to the past you're getting in the educational equity class, that this, at least, maybe in the negative, you know, here's not what Right, what not yeah. to do. not what to do. <laughs> right, right. But, I mean, I wonder if, if maybe that either of those two, that history is inspiring, history is instructive. Have you felt that in moments where you've had history courses or in your own studies of the past? You've, you, you alluded to someone being interested in science would be inspired by someone like Newton. Yeah. but. Maybe the like instructive to mention. Where have you found lessons in the past, or is that maybe a trickier proposition than it can sound like? Mm -hmm. um, I, when I look at a lot of my historical studies, and especially looking at like communities and like what is effective for solving disputes within communities, um, I see a lot of trends that from history and how to not handle a lot of things. Kind of going back to the negative. Um, like, for example, right now in our New Nation class, we just got done with a unit on the Lakota um, Native Americans and how a lot, a lot of the approaches were, we'll send the military in just to be safe, but how that would automatically sort of elevate a situation to a place where it would violence would only be the final result. So I kind of learned from that, <laughs> just never send in the military if you don't have to, because that just adds a whole other layer of tension. Um, that's just kind of an applicable thing to mm -hmm. sort of community discussion, but yeah. Mm. Uh, yeah, I think where I have had an instructive element in my studies has largely been in church history. Mm -hmm. um, so in Christianity and Western culture, <coughs> we have this discussion every semester um, about how we can learn from uh, church figures in the past, people like Augustine, people like Tertullian. Um, and so, so one relevant discussion is this ongoing thing about pacifism and military service. Mm -hmm. Well, those two figures that I mentioned both discuss this issue. And, and disagree. And disagree, right. yeah. And and so I think um, for myself, I'm I'm still figuring that out. I don't know the answer necessarily, but I see, oh, you mean the church has been dealing with this issue for 2,000 years? Mm -hmm. You mean it's not just, okay, I have to sit down and read the Bible and, and, and come up with that, that answer on my own in a vacuum. There are people that have looked at the Bible and have been working on this 
this issue and finding answers. Um, the Anabaptists are another example. They, mm -hmm. they come up with an answer later on in the, in the 16th century. Um, so, th so there are people that have wrestled with the same issues that I'm wrestling with today. Yeah, there's wisdom. So there's wisdom, yeah. yes. And tradition. And, you and disagreements, too. Every, and so maybe history inspires, sometimes it also challenges and convicts or at least forces you to rethink something. Right, mm -hmm. and I'm not the, the smartest generation or part of the smartest generation or the smartest person um, to have thought about this. So there are people that have dedicated a lot more time to the issues um, that are relevant and uh, so history helps us understand what those people thought. Students will say, I had no idea there was so much history in early American history. And I don't know if that's because of the way that it's taught in high school, if they, um, if they don't get much exposure to it. Um, but we use a lot of primary sources. We use a, a lot of um, scholarly articles. Um, it's a great way to explore historiography. Um, and I think, and this is probably true in other er eras, but at least for me in early America, there's a clear historiographic trail that you can follow. And it's very instructive for students to see, for example, um, like the um, growth of the idea of the Atlantic world. We do a research project which um, students have found very rewarding. We use the Slave Voyages database which has, is a database of tens of thousands of voyages and they pick one and they trace that voyage um, from the beginning, the middle passage, and then where it ends up. So it's a great class. I tell students I'm a closet colonialist. <laughs> if I could go back and redo my graduate school career, I probably would seriously consider colonial American history or early American history. Originally, Bethel Academy and Seminary is a pretty small institution. Uh, it starts to grow in the 20s, even during the Great Depression in the 30s, and then certainly in the 1940s. World War II causes a dip in enrollment, but as we'll hear more later, the growth is pretty amazing once you get past the war. Uh, right now I'm looking at a building that was from 1941, one of the residence halls. More of them were added later in the 40s into the 50s, but they started to run out of space. There's only so much room on this block of Snelling Avenue. And so um, eventually Bethel would move to a different campus. We'll tell that story later. But at least for the time being, they started to acquire property in the neighborhood. So right now you're actually looking at the former home of the history department. This was 1446 Arona. Uh, so this would be on the east side of campus. Um, I don't have a lot to say about the history department at this point, except that it was very small, usually just two or three professors, probably not that many students. But this was the home of the department for a long time. We at least have the address plate somewhere probably in AC 211, or maybe in the collection of our former colleague G.W. Carlson, who was a student here before the move and then taught at Bethel from 1968 to 2012. Okay, now we're going to meet another member of the department. I am a Bethel graduate, 1988. I'm a 1999 Bethel grad. I am a teacher at Minnehaha Academy. I am the pastor of worship and adult ministries here at Church of the Cross. Mutuality editor and publications coordinator. I work as an attorney in the business and corporate practice. English Language Institute, China, in China. Library director at the College of St. Scholastica. I am a history professor at Bethel University. I was a history major. I was a Bethel history major. I was a history major. I was a history major. I was a history major. History major. I was a history major. I was a history major. When I was a history major at Bethel for um, a, a full year and then half of another year, I was a TA in the department. And I kind of think of it as the glory days of the um, teaching assistants in the history department. Um, I made friendships through, lasting friendships. I mean, to this day, my closest friend was somebody that I met as a TA in the department. But it was just kind of a special time. We just all seemed to be around quite a bit. I think our social lives were limited. Um, and so we spent a lot of time down here around the department and um, probably my favorite memory is that at the very end of my senior year and my two closest friends who were TAs both were juniors so they weren't going to be graduating um, for another year but they planned a surprise for me where we actually spent the night in this very office. It was not my office at the time but uh, we thought we were so rebellious if that's the most rebellious thing one ever does. It's a little bit sad I suppose but um, we sat in here all night. We had grading to do so we did some grading and then we had to put paper over the window and we had to turn the light off and we could hear the security guards keys come clanking um, down the hall but we may or may not have taken a few 
artifacts or remnants of that experience that I do not think were missed, mostly because there were a lot of things in this office. But we did take a photo to kind of document um, our time there. We each dressed up in our professor's regalia, and we took a photo in the pose of Charlie's Angels. So that's probably my favorite memory. <laughs> So I started out as a social studies teacher and I really enjoyed it. So I really liked teaching. Um, I knew that um, I tried to figure out, well, what is it that I like so much about my job? And I realized that it's just, I like to be with people and that it is, um, I like working with students. And I also really enjoy trying to find, and this is kind of the key to teaching middle school or high school really, is how do you get the students who really have no interest in being there excited and are there because they're legally required by law um, to be in the room. Um, and so I really enjoyed teaching, but I also knew that I um, wasn't sure I wanted to stay exactly in the type of teaching that I was doing long term. Um, at the school that I taught um, at, which is Irondale High School in New Brighton, not very far here from Bethel, I had a um, significant number of students who were Muslim. I didn't necessarily know that they were Muslim. Um, they were from a variety of different um, immigrant um, backgrounds. Um, I had students who were from Somalia. I also had some students whose parents were Egyptian, and so they were Egyptian-American. They were first generation. Um, Americans. I also had students from Pakistan. Um, we have a very diverse population in the northern part of the metro area. And so I found, though, that in particular the Somali students um, had a little bit more difficulty integrating into the rest of uh, kind of the parts of the school environment. And so it sort of challenged me to kind of wa want to know why that was. Um, and Islam seemed to sort of be the common denominator and to why some of the particular issues and challenges were present. And so I pursued a master's degree in Islamic studies with the hope that I would actually just go right back to working in the school system as a cultural liaison, which is a position where you do teacher education and you do other types of staff education and you do some um, work between families and the school system, helping to kind of bridge the gap to help the school better serve the needs of the um, the family population and also to help the family kind of better answer questions for them that they might have um, about the public school system and how it works. But when I was only three weeks into my program um, in Islamic studies, September 11th happened and it just sort of changed everything and all of a sudden there was very much not just a local but a national as well as an international kind of um, you know, sort of call to become more aware and more educated about Islam. And so I'd stayed in contact with some of my professors here from Bethel, and I actually ran into them at dinner one night. Um, and they asked me what I was up to, and a few of them knew. And they said, you know, would you ever be interested in coming back and teaching a class on Islam? And I was really interested. I wasn't ready uh, at that point. Um, I was only a couple of months into my um, studies at that point, but I was really interested and I stayed connected. And so then um, I came to Bethel in J term of 2006 to bring back a course that had been created, I think, in the 1990s um, called Introduction to the Muslim World. And so I taught that course for the first time um, to a great group of students. So I feel like I'm always going to remember um, some of those students. I had a student who became a TA from that class. I had a student who I read scripture at his wedding from that class. So it's a really special class to me. And I just kind of stayed at Bethel ever since. So um, I'm finishing my PhD in Islamic studies, so I'm writing my dissertation right now, and I'm now a full-time member of the history department. I think for me, it really has to do with um, the people that I get to work with, as well as the students that I get to teach. I learned early on in my teaching career, back to when I was student teaching, that um, resources are great. Um, in terms of the type of technology that you have available to you, um, the type of environment you're actually in, but it all comes down to the type of people that you work with and that I'm a person that that's where I get my energy. So um, I remember once having um, an instructor um, at my, my own graduate school tell me you could be happy in a prison camp, Amy, if you like the people that you were with. And I thought, well, that's a good thing. Um, so I really like um, the fact that I get a lot of energy from our department. I think that we have a fantastic department with completely different personalities. So it's not that everyone is the same, but that we really kind of are united by a common mission, as silly as or as cheesy as that may sound, it really is true that I think that we have a love of scholarship, but we have a real love of teaching and using um, using history to really inspire our students. And so that's probably what I 
enjoy the most is just that um, I can't wait some days for what I know I'm going to be teaching because I know that that it's going to um, there's students that are going to be become passionate about it. There's students that are going to become angry about something that we read or something that they learned. There's going to be students that are going to feel convicted by it. And so the to be able to get to experience that over and over and over again, and I really like repetition. So to be able to get to do that over and over again is what keeps it new and exciting every year, even if you're doing, even if you're covering the same topics. One of the things that I love the most about teaching history is that you get to use a lot of different types of materials and resources. So it's not always just text. Um, for me, I've been integrating maps quite a bit more, not just into a particular class that I teach on environmental history, but actually into all of my classes. So um, maps are such a profound way for us to see change over time, um, to understand um, certain types of inequity. Uh, maps are a great way for us to understand social organization. Um, but in a particular class that I teach called History in the Human Environment, in conjunction with um, looking at maps, we also read an article by a woman named Melinda Mead. Um, she's a medical geographer, which was a relatively new field in the 1960s and the 1970s. And so she wrote a um, sort of revolutionary article called um, The Human Ecology of Disease. And in this particular article, she comes up with a, um, a sort of what she calls the triangle of um, human disease. And so she looks at these areas of population, and so the actual density that you of the area where you live, um, human behavior, um, and then your habitat, the actual kind of built environment. And she looks at the intersection between all of these to sort of look at how that impacts your overall human health. So we read um, this kind of seminal article of the, the, the discipline of environmental history, but specifically tied to this idea of medical geography and the fact that human health is related to how we live, not just sort of what's happening to us. But students read this article and then um, part of what we do, which was an idea that um, Kevin Craig first came up with is we have the students read it and then we have them essentially subject their own living environment to her principles. So the students come to class and they have analyzed um, where they currently are living or they can choose something from a place they've grown up in um, and they sort of subject themselves to, to her model of inquiry of trying to figure out sort of their state of human health. And so when you have students who are living in close quarters in dorm rooms that were built in the 1970s and you have them go through this experiment, it's really fun to have them come to class and absolutely be horrified <laughs> by the conditions that they're managing to overcome. So it, it's a really it's a really fun thing, but it gets them to really think about the impact. And, and also what I love is that at the end of the assignment, what we come back to is the recognition that we live in, you know, in many respects, one of the healthiest societies in the world, and that for us in America, so much of our, um, so many of our issues, disease, come down to our own control, that it comes down to how we can choose the way that we live, and we kind of then compare that with parts of the world um, and the types of diseases that are prevalent in other places, and realizing how much privilege actually impacts disease because it allows us to make choices, and when those choices aren't available to you, um, the different challenges that you're facing. So it, it's, there's lighthearted parts of the assignment, but and there's horrific parts of it, but at the same time, I think it's really thought-provoking, and it's, it, there are principles that we then take forward to look at all the other societies that we study in the class. My name is Austin Satram, and uh, I graduated from Concordia College with a social studies education degree, and uh, didn't actually go into teaching, um, but did one year of full-time ministry, and then Worked one year and then decided to come to seminary and pursue a Master of Divinity degree. So I'm currently uh, a year and a half into the Master of Divinity degree, degree here at Bethel Seminary. Seminary, I, I think what I've been learning most recently and, and most profoundly is that seminary isn't just for those who are called to uh, vocational ministry, as we like to call it, or many times often call it. Um, I've been convicted to call call it Christian service because I think we're all called to ministry, whatever the context, whether you're a banker, farmer, plumber, teacher, um, historian, we're all called to ministry. And so um, seminary, yes, it does a great job of training pastors, but it also does a great job of training those who are going to the workforce to know their, to have a deeper theological understanding, um, to just simply understand how to connect with those who aren't of the Christian faith, to share the gospel appropriately, effectively, lovingly, graciously, um, to be better leaders that influence others and spread the gospel. And um, so it's it's 
Yeah, seminary is, is a much um, broader education than I think a lot of people realize, a lot of students. At least when I was an undergrad, I thought, eh, seminary is for, either for those who are going to teach within a seminary, academic setting, or pastors. But it's so much more, and it's, it, it's beneficial for, for anyone, whatever vocation, whatever job God is calling you to. So 1944, Bethel celebrated 30 years here on the Snelling Avenue campus in St. Paul. But that was also in some ways the beginning of the end, and it's where we can start to understand why Bethel moved to Arden Hills. Because in 1944, the federal government passed the famous GI Bill of Rights. Among other things, it provided tuition benefits for returning servicemen and women that just uh, initiated a revolution in American higher education. Between 1940 and 1950, the college population in this country doubled in size, and it kept growing through the 50s into the 1960s. And that affected Bethel as well. Um, Bethel was originally just a few hundred students plus the seminary. By 1960, there were over a thousand students on this campus, and 20 years later, it doubled again to 2,000 students. So in 1961, recognizing that this campus was just too small, the Baptist General Conference decided to move Bethel to a different, bigger location. Later that year, the college acquired 213 acres on Lake Valentine from the DuPont Company. As you might have heard, they'd use that as a dynamite testing ground. Now, in many ways, it was a great deal. You often hear people call it the miracle on Lake Valentine. There also wasn't that much money, and so the move actually took place in a series of steps. The seminary was the first to go in the mid-1960s, but even then, there weren't enough buildings for the college. But finally, in 1972, they actually got the whole community together and walked north to Arden Hills to start the new fall semester at the new college facility. I should add that Bethel owned this campus here on Snelling Avenue for another few years, but in 1978 it was sold to the government, and today it's the Hubert H. Humphrey Job Corps Training Center. It's one of the largest uh, residential job training programs in the country. Okay, let's return for the second half of our conversation about the past as a foreign country and the usable nature of the past. So Kelly and Jacob, um, I think the notion that we have something to learn from the past rests on a prior assumption, which is the people of the past in some ways are just like us, right? I mean, mm -hmm. we can learn from them because they face the same kind of challenges, concerns, they feel like us, and, and I think that's important. In another way, though, the people of the past are fundamentally different from us in important yeah. respects. Oh, yeah. and, and a second idea that FIA introduces this week, um, borrowing from the British historian David Lo Lowenthal, is that the past is a foreign country, they do things differently there. And he has this elaborate idea of it's, it's almost like it's travel, right? As you go back mm -hmm. across time, it's like going across space. You cross cultural boundaries, linguistic, political, and you find that it's actually maybe uncomfortable or it's, it's at least unfamiliar. I wonder if you've had moments in, again, classes or other experiences where you felt that sense of the kind of alienness, the foreignness of the past. Mm -hmm. I think right yeah. now in our Reformations class, I get a lot of that vibe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Reformation. Yeah, because with church history, you know, I grew up in the church, so I understand, you know, certain aspects of the historical tradition, like Martin Luther, you know, hit the 95 Theses, pounded it on the door. Um, this is what Calvin's Geneva was like. But as we're studying it and beginning to, like, dive into the culture and reading excerpts from primary sources and interacting with it. There are times when I'm just like looking around at my classmates and I'm like, why are they doing this? This seems like so strange. Like, why are they arguing over the nature of like the Lord's Supper? And then to put it into like Aristotle's views and like how that has to relate to everything. And then when you put it in a context, you're just left saying, this is completely foreign to me. There's no way I could have understood this if I had not dove into the context and seen where it had come from. I don't know if you Yeah, know well, <laughs> speaking of Reformation, we've been talking about Donna Jane Peterman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll explain, though. All right, so, so Donna Jane Peterman was a woman part of the uh, Calvin's church at Geneva, and she decided she didn't like some aspect of the church, so she went somewhere else. She was church hopping. Yeah, uh, yeah, she was church hopping. She was church hopping. There you go. It's, I don't know it's if the first was, mistake. Yeah, first <laughs> big mistake. So the consistory and the, the council came together, and they uh, had a, um, this effort to excommunicate Donna Jane Peterman because she had visited another church. Um, and today that's something that's mm -hmm. just part of what, what? we do. Yeah. It, so to see that, I thought, wow, this is just this incredibly strict church uh, society. Is there any kind of sincere faith? Like, how, how do you have a love for God and, and do the spiritual disciplines when people are excommunicating each right. other for visiting another church? Well, I think we're especially so, prone to have these moments of realizing the foreignness exactly, if it starts yeah. someplace where you expect it to be familiar. Right. Mm -hmm. Right, because we expect, well, 
you know, I'm, I'm really going to be inspired. You know, I'm a Protestant. I mm -hmm. learned from the Reformation. Uh, Calvin, this is where I'm rooted yeah. in. You know, I've heard about <laughs> these. And then you kind of realize that beyond a certain kind of history, there's a deeper kind that actually is quite... I don't teach a lot of American history, but whenever I do, I, I try to find moments to jar people a little bit. Like, you know, in some respects, this is the same country. It's the same territory. It's the same language. And yet it's not. Yeah. I mean, there are certain That's assumptions really that have changed. There are certain... Uh, you know, gender roles have changed. Assumptions about education and what's available to you have changed. Um, the place of people of color have changed. I mean, and so it's it's helpful to jar people out of those yeah. kind of comfortable assumptions from time to time. Um, I, I wonder if what do we do then to help make that voyage or that that trip? Right? What? Um, so to to torture the metaphor for it, like, what do we <laughs> what do we pack in our suitcases? Like, do you have any travel advice for students who are just entering their studies? So, I mean, it's it should be jarring probably to some expect. But are there are there ways you can make that transition easier, just as you can prepare for travel to a foreign country or study abroad more easily? Well, don't pack your judgmental mindset right away. Check that out yeah, the door. Yeah, that's, that needs to be uh, scanned out at the security check. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the know, metaphor is going yeah, too far just, now. Just, yeah. <laughs> driving, just, yeah, but I, I mean, I bring a, a notebook and a, and a pen or pencil to write and um, or my computer to take notes on things. Um, I bring my, my textbooks and my, my resources. Mm -hmm. So I mean, I, I, I dive into these stories and these strange, um, well, foreign countries of the past, so to speak, um, by getting into the text mm -hmm. and interacting with the primary sources and the things that these people wrote. I think first-person um, primary source accounts are really helpful. Um, if you can find a good novel or even a good movie, sometimes mm -hmm. that can be helpful mm -hmm. to interact with something as a story rather than a set of um, points about the past. Uh, and that's kind of the difference between a cultural history and a um, high political or sure. military history. So getting down to the basic level of what daily life looked like um, really involves like some of that primary source digging and, and careful you know, to a certain extent, I mean, I think this is something students, you know, you, you ought to expect of your professors, you know, that you, you have a tour guide in a sense, right? Someone yeah, at least to kind of take you there take and maybe the then to give you some of these tools. Um, so I mean, I think to a certain extent you, you rely on them at least to get started. But mm -hmm. um, you know, part of the development is learning to do this by yourself and, and developing the curiosity to then want to yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you know that that's a great way to do it. Is you know how can you encounter primary sources? Um, things that are going to jar you a little bit. Um, culture shock is a word I use in the modern era of class. Um, Kelly, what about you? What, what now that you've had a fair number of history classes, have you learned, picked up any tools besides checking judgment at the door? Yeah. Um, I think you almost need like something. I don't know whether it's a good analogy for this, but like something to see like the invisible aspects of the history because I think of like when you watch a historical film and like The Patriot and everyone has perfect teeth and nobody's like really sick and has like the diseases <laughs> of the time and they've got their, you know, like luxurious hair, like they've just showered with Pantene or something. Um, and then you watch a film that's maybe more historically accurate and you kind of see like the griminess and you know, the role that, um, you know, what happens when you don't get enough vegetables and you get really sick, you know, <laughs> like this scurvy. is, yeah, this yeah. is like the diet that you're on. This is, you know, how your behavior is affected by the minutia of everyday life from your historical time period. Like, I think sometimes we picture the past as sort of a perfect movie set version mm -hmm. where you mm -hmm. can slip in and you just see like the big ideas and what people were thinking about, but you don't get a deal with like the nitty gritty of mm -hmm. what is, what do you do when your child is sick? and you don't have the food to feed them. Like that sort of like everyday problem and how that affects your thinking of when you're, or am I going to participate in the French Revolution when I don't have enough food, you know? Um, just seeing how like those teeny tiny little like things um, of social history really play into the bigger um, grand ideas that you usually are what you're focusing on when you study the past. So. Yeah, you have to really work at developing that imaginative mm -hmm kind of muscle yeah. to and, go there. Yeah, and just connecting, I would say, social history and the, the way that people were living their day-to-day -day lives with the grand political history or military history. I think sometimes that's a detail that's overlooked when you're going to the past, and that's what makes the transition really rough, um, mm -hmm. so that you don't get to examine that further. So. Magnifying glass, that's a good one. That's <laughs> a magnifying glass, <laughs> yes. Okay, thanks, nice. Kelly and Jim. Yeah. Well, that's it for this week's webisode. Uh, we're going to say goodbye in just a second, but before we go, a little bit of a coda here. Uh, if you don't know your St. Paul geography, you might not realize that we're right next door to the Minnesota State Fairgrounds, right across Snelling Avenue over there. 
there's a little bit of a connection between Bethel and the state fairgrounds. In the middle of the 1940s, during World War II, Bethel decided to build a new men's dormitory. There's a big fundraising campaign, but things were going slowly enough that in 1946, when classes started, there was no place to put everyone. You had all sorts of veterans coming back on the GI Bill. And so while they were waiting to construct Edgar and Hall, some of the guys actually had to live across the street at the state fairgrounds. They called it the barn, El Barno. Okay, we'll be back next week for more about how historians do what they do. Black baby.